All right, we are now on to the last uh, video for Chapter 15. Um, objective I that's on here, we're actually not going to cover. That's um, the first section of Chapter 17. Um, typically, we throw it in, but I think I'm going to leave it off this time, so don't worry about writing this objective down. So we're just going to do H, so how reproductive isolation can play a role in speciation, and we'll look at some patterns in evolution. So most scientists define speciation as the process by which some members of a sexually reproducing population change so much that they can no longer mate with the original population. Um, and the key for species is that they have to be in a, a reproductive community, but there are two types of reproductive isolation. So the first one is called a prezygotic isolating mechanism. So this is actually in play before fertilization can actually occur. So these mechanisms prevent genotypes from entering a population's gene pool, usually due to a geographic, ecological, behavioral, or some other kind of difference. An example would be um, two closely related species that breed at different times of the year or ones that have different kinds of mating calls. So these ones work bef worked and happened before reproduction could even be considered. Now, the other one is called a post-zygotic isolating mechanism. So this operates after fertilization has occurred to ensure that the resulting offspring remains infertile. So the example here, and this is not the only example, but a lion and a tiger are considered a separate species because even though they can mate, the offspring, which is a liger or a tigon, depending on which lion or tiger is the male or the female, is entirely sterile. Now, this situation would never happen in the wild. This is an entirely human-created situation. But, like I said, all of these organisms that are produced out of this are sterile. They cannot reproduce on their own. Um, there's something about their reproductive systems not being fully formed or their body is actually not even able to produce um, their, their reproductive cells. I had, I'd have to look that up. But post-zygotic, another example, um, which is one that's a little more closer to home, is the mule. The, the Missouri mule, which is actually something that we're known for, um, it is the crossbreeding of a quarter horse with a donkey. And again, that the donkey and the quarter horse are different enough and that they will still produce a mule, but the mule uh, obviously is going to be sterile. All right, so speciation. Um, for speciation to occur, a population has to be separated and reproductively isolated. Now, there are two ways that this can happen. Now, this is pronounced allopatric speciation. So this one is actually a physical barrier that's going to divide a population into two or more. Now, scientists think that this is the most common form of speciation for animal species. So there was a legitimate barrier keeping a, that separated a population and kept them separated long enough to where they no longer could interbreed with each other. So for animal species, this is the most common accepted idea. Now, the other one is a sympatric speciation. So a new species evolves into, or sorry, a species evolves into a new species without a physical barrier. Fairly common in plants is the common idea. Not so much in animals, um, unless there was some kind of random mutation that changed it instantly, but the likelihood of that happening is kind of slim. Now, both types of speciation have the same ending result. Essentially, the separated populations can no longer interbreed. Um, I'm not sure why this picture is on here. It shouldn't be. But we'll just move on. All right. Um, patterns in evolution. Um, if you take zoology with me, this is something that we actually talk about with every chapter. Um, 
Even though first-hand accounts of speciation are very rare to see, the evidence is visible in evolutionary patterns. Um, so something that we talk about in zoology is this term called adaptive radiation or divergent evolution. So it's when a single species diversifies into a number of different species. Now with the zoology book, we have a lot of diagrams that are looking like this. Now this is called a cladogram. This blue line represents time, all right, with this organism down here being the earliest of that particular line of species. So as time moves on, every offshoot that we have is the development of a new species or a divergent line of species. So from these early primates, it diverged the first time to produce lemurs and lorises, which lorises are essentially lemurs without tails. And then moving along, moving along, tarsiers, new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and then humans and other primate apes. All right. Um, we look at diagrams frequently like this for our zoology class just because it's easier to see it, um, see how things evolved over time looking at diagrams like this. Some other things that we can look at, we can look at coevolution, um, species with a close relationship that evolve together. So this can kind of go back to the chapter that we talked about mutualism. So bees and nectar producing flowers, they evolve together because they need each other in order to do their daily jobs. And then you have things called convergent evolution. So unrelated species evolve similar traits even though they live in different parts of the world. Um, generally this is due to the fact that they have a similar ecology and environment, climate, that sort of thing. But here's a, a really good example is if you look at the Australian marsupial species, they actually have a placental mammal cousin, so to speak. So again, marsupials, they give birth to very, very small embryos and then the embryos crawl into a pouch and continue to develop then. Um, the placental mammals are giving birth to live young, so humans are placental mammals. So we have the marsupial mole and then the regular mole. Ant eaters, mice, lemurs, flying squirrels, some type of cat, and then some type of wolf. So they are their, you know, marsupials versus mammal counterparts. All right, and then the last slide of the day and of this chapter, um, how fast does speciation actually occur? Well, the most accepted idea is this idea of gradualism. So the idea that evolution takes place in small gradual steps. But then there's others that believe that it is more of a situation of what we call punctuated equilibrium. The theory that evolution occurs relatively sudden, suddenly and then it's followed by long periods of stability. So you'll have a bunch of evolution happen at one time and then it will stop evolving for another long period of time. So personally, I'm more of an on the gradualism idea. I think that it's always occurring, but you, I can kind of see the point being made out of punctuated equilibrium. But again, that's something that is, that is being contested by scientists and you know, more evidence is always needed. So this is the last slide. There is one more assignment that you need to do with this one and then we will be doing some review for the EOCs next week. Um, I might be able to send it directly to you via a link, um, but I will have to play around with it and see if it will actually give you permission um, to get in and play with it. So um, if you have any questions, again, let me know, and I will talk to you all later.